So hi, Jill, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to chat all about mold with you today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real treat. Yeah, I've really been excited about this and mold is a bit of a strange subject to get excited about, but it's something that I've been dealing with. The listeners probably have heard me mention it here and there, but we haven't done a full deep dive into it. So I thought you'd be the perfect person to have on. And how did you get into specializing in mold? So out of all the things in functional medicine and holistic health that you could choose, why mold for you? Well, it started with dealing with people um, in my patient base. I'm in a Lyme endemic community. So I ended up becoming a Lyme specialist because I didn't understand exactly how complex Lyme was and all the different ways that it can affect the body. And when you use naturopathic principles of fi- you know, find and treat the cause, um, and we're doing things from a holistic place, we're making sure diet is squared up and sleep habits are addressed and circadian rhythm and movement and all those things that are really important, usually people get better. But I had this group of patients that just didn't respond. You know, they would get incrementally better with all of the diet changes and the, you know, they were working so hard, 110% effort for 2% benefits. <laughs> and in one of that, those patients in his home, they found black mold. And it had apparently been there for about 10 to 12 years. And I started getting into the research and realizing, wow, I think that that's what's been the block for him. I wonder if that's what's going on with all these other people. And again, the more I dug into the research, the more I really understood all the ways that mold can affect the body, then I started to see it, you know, that it was, oh my goodness, this is the block for this person and this person and this person with MS and this person with, you know, all these strange conditions that it, it was really literally the light bulb going off. Then treating it, people responded. And that gave me a good opportunity to sort of create a protocol that I, I've tried certain things that seem like a good idea and I've made people worse. And I've tried things that I didn't think would work, just that we were treating something else, that that's why I come to the antifungal treatment. I was treating people for other things, adding in these antifungals, and their neurological system was getting better. So it was just this kind of awareness of um, all of the ways that mold affects the body. And um, then we had mold in my own home and I didn't recognize that it was going on, which is, that was the big thing for me of just realizing, okay, it even tricked me. Mm -hmm. I do this every day. I've done this for a decade and I didn't even recognize it happening to myself. And even though I have a clinical questionnaire I developed through practice, I didn't, I didn't apply the same principles to myself and my family. Even our dog was getting sick. So, you know, it was just one of those things that um, after the flood revealed itself and I knew exactly what to do because I had a protocol already, I felt very compelled to write my book, Break the Mold, because I thought I, it's almost unfair that I know all of this and everybody has access to these tools, but they don't know how to use them, and that they're, they're a tool for mold. That's how I got here. (laughs) Yeah, the exact same thing happened to me. I was researching it initially for myself. And when I started to get down into the research and I started to notice for my clients, oh, maybe this person has it. Oh, this person, I've really missed this key (laughs) factor. It's really crazy, Uh isn't it? Some of the symptoms that could be connected. Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the things when people, um, other practitioners take my online training and they get the questionnaire, they say, wow, when I was reading through your questionnaire, I had no idea that that was a mold thing until I saw it on your questionnaire. And it could be anything from, you know, the obvious lung, sinus kind of things, but then these weird things like ear ringing and pelvic pain and um, certain rashes and then hormone changes. I mean, so many weird hormone things that don't follow the rules. Um, that was another group of, of patients that I was like, why is this person having such a hard time going through menopause? My goodness, you know, is it unresolved childhood trauma? Is it all these other things? And, you know, it wasn't any of that it was that she had a, a huge mold exposure. Yeah. And yeah. I think a lot of people are missed because when you speak about mold, they either think that they have to see it on the walls, like this black furry stuff growing out of the walls, or exactly. they think of a mold allergy. So they're like, Mm -hmm. no, I've had allergy tests. My doctor's ruled that out and I don't have a mold allergy. But what's the difference between mold allergy and what we're talking about today? It's like a mold illness, chronic inflammatory type condition. Yeah, that's a really good point. So um, mold makes you sick through many different ways than we realized before. 
Um, mold obviously has spores. Those are the little, you know, factories. <laughs> but the factories also pump out chemicals. And then they also defend themselves with a separate chemical called mycotoxins. So I'm trying to expand the definition of mold illness to include all of these other things. If you look on the CDC website in the US here, they list mold sickness as asthma, allergies, hay fever, and um, exacerbations of asthma. So you can see it's all kind of respiratory, and those are symptoms related to interaction with the spores. But the bulk of my patients that I see, even before this is what I specialized in, this is most of the, the injury from mold is coming from the chemicals and the mycotoxins. So the chemicals are just the regular factory smoke, so to speak, of the mold just doing its normal business and um, metabolizing and that kind of thing. And these are things that make people very chemically sensitive. And this is where we get a big hormone change because they run through the same detoxification systems in the body as the liver or as the, as our hormones. So through the liver and um, also through the kidneys. So these are like um, alcohols, aldehydes, VOCs, things like that, that are just the normal smoke. Then there's this other super poisonous toxin called mycotoxins that the mold will spit out to kill anything that wants to move into its territory. So it's a very adept survivor. And we're familiar with this, actually. A lot of people, it's more helpful if they visualize the whole penicillin thing. You know, you have the moldy bread and there's the mold in the center. And then there's this ring of sterile area around it that doesn't allow any bacteria to grow or any other mold species. And what that ring is, is a ring of mycotoxins. So that's what we collect to make penicillin. So when you start to really see, okay, for my patient base, 75 to 80% of their symptoms are due to the mycotoxins and the chemicals and not due to the spore. So if you are having, if you're in a building environment where you're being affected by mold, you could be only affected by the mycotoxins because these are ultra small toxins that can move through building materials and the spores can be trapped behind the building material and you don't have any interaction with those, but the toxins can come into your inter internal air and poison your indoor air. So you can have mold sickness without any visible mold. And that's, what, that's why you can have a negative allergy test. I don't see people have mold positive allergies until they have some kind of interaction with a spore and or if they've had enough toxin exposure that their immune system is now suppressed and now they're reacting to outdoor molds. So there is a crossover allergy that we see. Yeah. And yeah. how is the, this type of mold indoors different from the one outside? Because people will say, oh, we're exposed to mold all the time. We've evolved with mold and fungus. So why is it different now that it's indoors? Right. So when it's outdoors, it has a bunch of control factors that keep it from misbehaving. It, it's grounded. It's connected to the good mushrooms and the other fungal world. It's connected to sunlight, wind, so you don't have this sort of manufactured, um, ungrounded, disconnected, stagnant, and without sunshine and fresh air situation. So it's in an unnatural environment as well. We're confusing mold, the way that we build our buildings. So it starts to act competitively because it doesn't have those same grounding features as being in nature, just like us. We're the same way. Yeah. And how many people do you think roughly this is affecting? So if you would to just give a rough estimate i've heard statistics like 50 percent of buildings in the us are water damaged but um are everyone is everyone who's living in those houses going to be affected in some way good question so um yes the osha has estimated that over 25 percent of all us buildings have had enough water damage to host toxic mold so that's the difference it can be water damage half might be water damage but not every water damage event creates a an indoor toxic mold situation so i kind of roughly go with this like mm, a, over 25 percent. i don't know what how much over over is um, but we have changed our building practices here in the u.s and that has created more mold indoors we've added certain um, it's called osb and plywood and certain building materials and building techniques that we do we build right through a rainstorm now we have so much confidence in this you know treated wood that it'll just pour all over it and then they close the house up. So there are different building practices that just were never done that we're doing now that has increasing that number. Of those people, 
you asked the question, does mold affect everybody? Well, militaries around the world are creating mycotoxins as bio warfare. So we know it affects everybody. The issue is dose, duration, and sensitivity. So not everybody is going to be affected at a low dose, low grade um, exposure. Not everybody's going to be affected if it's just a short duration. And not everybody has that kind of genetic susceptibility, which has a little bit to do with their HLA um, expression, but in my practice, way more to do with their genetic polymorphisms on detoxification. So if they can't detoxify, since this is a toxin-based illness, like I said, 75 to 80% of the symptoms I see are based on the toxin, not the spore. So if you can't detoxify, you have some kind of MTHFR SNP or CBS or some of those, that makes your, your mold sensitivity heightened and harder for you to detox out those mycotoxins and get better. That doesn't mean you can't. That just means that, that you have to be the person that takes those extra detox steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it's more the rule than the exception that you have only one person in a home start to react and everybody else is fine. Yeah. So talk a bit not, about the difference between yeah. men and women as well, because that's an interesting point. Yes. Yes. So women and children tend to have higher body fat. And the most important thing for people to understand is that these mycotoxins are fat soluble. So they can basically store in the fat in our body. So it stands to reason then that people who have a higher bat, body fat percentage just by, you know, children, because they're, they're still growing and you, they need that fat for all kinds of hormones, growth hormone storage. But for women, just because we tend to have a higher body fat percentage. So we will store up and become our own storehouses of these toxins. And it can disrupt all of our systems um, that have to do with fat. So that's like, that's going to be our brain, our bone marrow, the lining of our nervous system. That's why we see MS type symptoms commonly with mold. If it's a, a really big exposure, um, we can see Alzheimer's because of the brain, all the um, linings of our nerves, my missing glands, our gut lining, like there's fat all over inside of our body and the coating on our organs. I mean, we just don't really realize how much the, those fat soluble toxins, all the different places where they can disperse. That's incredible. And that's why we mm -hmm. are more susceptible. And it can be a bit of a vicious cycle as well, because having mold toxicity can lead to weight loss resistance or like chronic weight gain, can't it? So then yes. you're storing the molds and then your um, metabolism has been affected by that. I see weight loss resistance being a huge factor. Do you see like people huge. who work on that start to lose the weight quite significantly? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I actually had um, one patient, she had had such a hard time losing weight. And in the, th so total was three months doing the treatment. The first thing was just to get out of her exposure. So she had to get out of her home for a while while it was being remediated. And just that she lost five pounds. And then by the end of the three months, she had lost 30 pounds and she changed nothing other than adding the vegetables, but she was already really doing all the right things. You know, she was eating a super healthy diet, but um, doing the, the full treatment of supporting her body to detoxify was 30 pounds in three months. And I mean, you talk to any woman, that's a hard thing to do. <laughs> 30 pounds is really yeah. hard. But it's also some people can actually cause, have weight loss. And that has to do with if your GI system is your Achilles heel, that's where you're more sensitive. These mycotoxins can um, cause destruction of the lining of the digestion. It can thin it and cause leaky gut and also a, a high inflammatory response. So for some people, their reaction is that they can't um, absorb the food anymore because we've now taken those absorptive surfaces and cut them down and they will get malnutrition and they'll start to lose weight and they lose weight primarily in skeletal muscle and they start to gain fat, but they're losing weight overall. So it becomes this skinny fat situation. Um, and that is very common in men. That's how men particularly express. But mm. also, you know, we see that in some women that they'll just be like, I can't gain weight. I'm losing weight. I'm losing weight. But those are, those tend to be the people that they have a hard time keeping weight on anyway. No, yeah. for some people with weight loss resistance, that sounds dreamy, but it isn't, <laughs> it's not, is they're, they're getting sicker and sicker as they go on more and more depleted. 
yeah that's what i'm hoping to happen to me when i move hopefully in the next few weeks it's been put off temporarily because of the whole corona virus uh, thing um so i'm currently living in the like water damage moldy building and that's a bit of a stress on my i'm just kind of testing my patients every day but even as a nutritional therapist i feel like i'm holding a, a, like 10 kilograms 20 pounds of excess mm -hmm. body weight mm -hmm. and i'm not doing this for like aesthetic reasons or anything just i know like what my healthy weight is and i eat the best diet i exercise strength train and i just can't seem to shift it so let's hope when i move mm -hmm. that starts to improve as well along with my histamine and food sensitivities mast cell issues i've got the yes. whole whole list of problems the whole yeah, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> yeah I, the I think of it as a blessing really... yeah i mean your body is telling you yeah. something's wrong and that's what I see. One of the most common symptoms that I see is anxiousness because the, the body knows something is off. And especially if your bedroom is, or where you sleep at night is where the mold is, people have terrible insomnia because the body keeps waking them up saying, get out, get out, you know, and it's really your body being smart. So I know it's hard when your body is exhibiting symptoms to kind of love it and say thank you for communicating to me and hang in there we're going to get there but um you know listen to those things and those are the things that help people once they've recovered not have a terrible relapse because those symptoms come up right away or they might you know you know your body so once you're recovered you get a little bit um hyper vigilant on your symptoms sometimes but it's really useful because then you can say okay this restaurant is not a good place for me to spend time or, you know, a hotel or whatever. You can ask for a different room. There are lots of things that you can do then to, by listening and honoring those symptoms. Exactly. And a lot of these environmental toxins and perfumes and parabens that I'm reacting to, these are affecting everyone's health, but other people don't get yes. outward symptoms. So I'm like the canary in the coal mine. And eventually yeah. I do want to specialize in more of mold and environmental and um, more chronic illness so I, I feel like I'm going through this currently to expand my knowledge and help other people mm -hmm. having to tell myself that like it's there's going to be a, a silver lining throughout all of this but it is very overwhelming I was kind of happy and kind of very overwhelmed and upset when I saw my lab results but it's a, a whole nother journey that I'm going to have to go on <laughs> yeah and well sometimes those kind of results are like dang and whew, yeah, you know, because then there's an answer. There's, something. there's a, something to do, and that's that's my message of hope is that, and the whole reason I wrote the book is you can absolutely get better from this. You know, this is a treatable situation. For some people, they've been so sick for so long. There's a secondary thing that has started, like a dementia or mm. MS or autoimmune disease or cancer diagnosis or something. But so that's a whole other process. But as far as the the treating the mold, your body wants to be better. Our bodies have incredible innate healing capacity and so by helping you know to honor it and give the give the nourishment that it needs and help with detoxification help knock down those the fungal overburden in the body you can completely get better from this great love hearing that little yeah. bit of inspiration because what you read online it's like it's terrible you can't live the get out burn all of your clothes <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to get into all of that. So like yeah. your approach to treatment, but sure. first let's start with testing. So we've just mentioned testing. Um, I use the Great Plains Lab mycotoxin panel. I'm not sure which mm -hmm. one you would use. So testing both bodies and houses, what would you suggest? Yeah. So um, I'm a body expert much more than a building expert. So I'll hit the bodies first. I try to get as many data points as possible to tell me what's going on. If we think it's mold, urine mycotoxin testing is very useful. Um, I like the mass spect method, which is the um, what is being used at Vibrant Wellness and Great Plains. Um, so, and Vibrant, you know, to shop between the two, you just need to look at like, does, which mycotoxins might you be looking for if you already know what your building exposure is, and then price and, you know, turnaround time and those kind of things. But the limitation of that test is that we don't know how much of it is coming from food, and we don't know if the body is able to excrete these toxins. So um, that's one thing I, I liked about Vibrant is they're very open to taking on the research of, well, let's find out, you know, let's find out those kind of things. So um, we're working to try to get some, some research on that to find out, should you, you know, what foods do you need to give up for how many days? 
I have a little sheet that I have that anybody's welcome to it. If you're a practitioner or you're taking your own test, that's a little prep sheet that goes over the foods to avoid. And I do for three days because of some of the research that shows how long it takes to detoxify some of these mycotoxins. Um, so I have the foods to avoid and then whether you should or shouldn't take glutathione and take binders. And usually what I generally recommend is if you can't be off glutathione for any reason, then you use the ELISA method for urine mycotoxins because it tends to not wiggle around so much and give you false negatives. That's my experience, but we still don't really know. We still need to kind of see. So um, I generally have people go off, go off or not start glutathione or binders and then do asana or exercise or movement because sometimes people are just too sick to exercise. So that's where asana can be helpful or just even a hot bath or wrap up in blankets and try and get a sweat the night before. And then we take the test. Um, that has been the most reliable results for me and my patients, but that's a data point. It's a very useful one and it's a big data point. But other things we might look at is the VCS test Dr. Shoemaker created. I'm not a Shoemaker trained doc, but I do use his test commonly. And it's the visual contrast sensitivity test. This can be normal and you can still have mold illness. The reason I use this is it tells me how deep has this problem gone into the person's nervous system. And that tells me also like which particular, how heavy do I have to go with essential fatty acids? Which ones do I need to use? That kind of thing. So that's another data point. If we have those two only, and um, or even just you know anything saying positive mold, we can get right into treatment and working on where is that coming from. The other thing I like to run commonly is a natural killer cell function test because it also tells me how depleted the immune system is and how aggressively I'm going to have to go with the antifungal part and for how long. So if your NK cell function is low then we know, okay, this is going to be probably a two-year situation for you of treatment. That doesn't mean you're going to feel cruddy for two years, but that your immune system has become so depleted and rewired because these toxins can rewire you at the gene level. We need to support you through that next couple of years so that this doesn't become a relapse, remission, relapse, remission kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. So those are my three big hitters. And then of course, you know, just for cheap and easy, I look at a CBC, which is complete blood count. We're checking for things like anemia. We're checking for things like a low white count. And then if there's any kind of shift in your immune cells, I also look at liver enzymes. That tells me a lot. If somebody has had a high GGT, then I know that they have a really active mold colony in their, in their environment because it's acting like an alcoholic. You know, the, that you're actually breathing factory smoke, meaning the molds are just going along and they're doing what they do. Um, one of the things on the Great Plains Lab is called MPA, which is mycophenolic acid. That's another one that's just, that's a chemical of normal metabolism. So when that's high, even if your mycotoxins are negative, we know there's actively factory working mold in your environment that you're being exposed to. Yeah, that was it doesn't really list. matter if your mycotoxins are negative because- okay that is not testing all the mycotoxins that ever exist in the whole world. We're only testing a certain number of mycotoxins. So if your MPA is high, there's mold in the environment, not necessarily mycotoxins if the mold doesn't feel threatened, but commonly, yes, mycotoxins. It's just, they may not be the ones we're testing for. That was the one that was off the charts for me. Um, ah. I acid on the urine test. I think the upper limit is like 50 and I was like 330. Oh, and that's yeah. the one that's, it's used as a pharmaceutical drug, isn't it? Yes, it's used in pharmaceuticals to for organ rejection. So <laughs> it's basically, we know <laughs> it's um, reliably immune suppressive, um, so much so that we use it in medicine. There are quite a few mycotoxins actually that are used to yeah. shut down autoimmune responses and things because mm -hmm. they're so reliably immune suppressive. My MPA is also very hard on the gut. So that's one of them. Makes yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. And that's, um, that one gets, goes through the glucuronidation in the liver. And there are two things that are really great for making sure you've upped your ability to detoxify that. One is green tea and one is um, grape seed extract. Okay. So those are two things. If your MPA is really high that are really mm -hmm. safe to take, they have very low side effects and have been shown to help improve liver glucuronidation for MPA. Interesting. And what about yeah. calcium D-glucurate? Because I was taking that for another reason. I was 
um, learning about, I think, from Beth O'Hara. I actually interviewed mm -hmm. her yesterday. She was talking about glucuronidation. That's kind of her thing along with yes. um, um, histamine intolerance and mast cell. So um, I started with calcium deglucurate. Do you think that would be something as well to help with glucuronidation? Yeah. yeah. We know that that helps glucuronidation. For some people that can actually manipulate hormones a little bit. So we just kind of, you know, for that one, I don't do general recommendation because yeah. it's more of an individualized mm -hmm. recommendation for that. Yeah. One. And I pieced that yeah. together with my GI map and the beta glucuronidase yes. was elevated. My Dutch showed elevated estrogen. So it makes sense for okay. me. But if anyone's listening, don't just go and take what we're suggesting right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Understand that there's some nuance to it. Yeah. But Definitely. that there are tools. I mean, that's what I'm trying to get out there is that there are tools that you can use. And what I put in my book are things that are generally safe for, you know, babies to, to elderly um, at the doses that I recommend. Of course, for children, you need to adjust them by their body weight. But, you know, if a child is, is weaned or eating, if they're eating food, they can do all the things in my book. They can do, you know, safely with the dose adjustment um, all the way to the elderly. So I tried to make sure the things in the book, but yeah, there are way more things that a mold literate doctor or practitioner can do for you to individualize treatment. Yeah, there's lots of mums and parents listening to the podcast so they're always like yes. you never talk about children and yeah <laughs> a lot of the same things can be done like diet wise so um yes. yeah it's great that you've got that resource in your book as well and yeah and i should have put clark's rule in my book mm. this is something where you dose adjust based on body weight yeah the doses that are in my book are based on 150 pound male that's what we don't that's what you know all pharmaceuticals are based on that's what so for when you're looking at the dosing of certain things you take the body weight of the child divided by 150 pounds. And so again, I don't know, I can't do kilogram right off. So I'd be 200 yeah. kilograms. And so, yeah. So um, you just do that division and then that's the, that's the, um, what you multiply the dose by. And that's yeah. The big calculators right. online that they can go on and put in the um, weight of the child and all of that. So yeah. they'll be available Great. to you. Yeah. And P previously perfect. you mentioned about the link between mold and Lyme and uh -huh. the immune suppression and all of that. So last week I got my um, Armin Labs line uh, panel back with co-infections and everything. And yes. my natural killer cells and CD57, is it? Were mm -hmm. like very suppressed. So I was thinking, yes. and my Borrelia came back at a two. Anything above three is considered positive. Between one and two is considered mildly positive. So now I'm like, is it mold that's just causing this? Or is it Lyme that's potentially driving it, but could you talk about the connection between those two? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's why um, Dr. Horowitz in the US, he has the Lyme MSIDS questionnaire. I use that questionnaire as the motivation to create my questionnaire way back when this is all, you know, I don't know, in the Lyme world, we were all trying to figure this out. You know, why is the CD57 jumping all around? Someone can look really sick from Lyme, but their CD57 is high and someone can look really suppressed, like they're not outwardly sick, but they're sick, you know, they're just like, um, it, it's a suppressed sick. They don't have a huge inflamed joint from Lyme disease, but they're, they're hobbling because of pain. And those people's CD57 was low. So it was like, what's going on with this whole Lyme and CD57 thing. And then we found out about mold's effect on the natural killer cells. So at, when you take the 10,000 foot view between mold and Lyme, um, Lyme needs you to be alive for it to survive. So it doesn't want to kill you. It wants to impair you. <laughs> you know, it doesn't want to impair you, but it wants to survive. But it's never going to do that to the point, or it doesn't intend to do that to the point where you're no longer a good host for it. Whereas mold would rather compost you. So when I approach a Lyme mold situation, and sometimes those Lyme tests are going to be falsely negative or lower than they would look if you have mold on board because of the, the reliable immunosuppressive effects that mold creates at the gene level. Also, you know, to directly at the immune cells, but it does rewire your genes. So for me, mold is where I start and you might have to also be treating the Lyme at the same time, but um, it it's, can't be forgotten about or you won't get better from Lyme. Yeah. That's been my experience. Yeah, I asked my friend, she specializes in Lyme as well in the UK, and she said the exact same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Just focus on the mold, and then if needed, sometimes they can mimic each other. They're both known as the great yes. mimickers. They can both yes. look like MS or multiple sclerosis, or rheumatoid arthritis, those types of things. So they do yes. commonly go hand in hand. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't want to miss the building side of things. I know that you're not like yes. a buildings expert, but yes. how would you recommend checking out your home? So you said that you don't need to visibly see anything, but would you recommend right. just getting in the local handyman to come in or does it need to be an expert in this area? Yeah, well, um, I get a little flack from the certified building biologists that I work with that they're like, why did you only put mycotoxin dust testing in your book? You know, there's so many other things. So just I'll qualify that with there is you need a holistic assessment um, of your house if you find that you have a mold problem or you're exhibiting mold symptoms. But where I start is a mycotoxin dust test, because then you're at least assessing whether there are mycotoxins in your environment and then if there are, that doesn't tell you, is it a now problem or is it a past problem, unfortunately, but at least you know there's, there are mycotoxins in your environment and they, they would be affecting your health. If they're present, they're affecting you. So I usually start with that dust test and um, basically what you want to do is, is take dust from reliably dusty places that you wouldn't have cleaned recently. So that's usually the top of picture frames that are really high up, the top of cabinets that are high up try to not collect anywhere near a door or a window because then you might be getting things from the outdoors. Um, And, you know, maybe under furniture that doesn't get moved a lot or behind furniture that doesn't get moved and collect a general dust sample and send that in. I use um, real-time labs for that, for the dust sample. I don't know if you have anything in the UK that you have for... Not that I've looked, not that I've found. um, There's just a company called Building Forensics, but I think they're like the big... um, investigators as to like the ones that you were mentioning previously Mm. so i don't know of any kits like that i'm sure that Mm -hmm. they could be sent from the u.s yeah um, Yeah. i'll do a bit of research and if i find anything okay i haven't looked into that but if you do let me know because i definitely consult with people in the uk okay it'd be nice to have yeah yeah yeah. definitely Yeah. yeah so that's a nice you know it's just at least tells you um is this a problem or not because the hard thing with mold illness is that your illness could be from an exposure up to 20 years ago. So once you've been affected by that indoor environment, the mycotoxins from that environment turn on a protective mechanism in your own flora. And now your own flora starts to behave badly and create mycotoxins. And if you get the immune suppressed enough, the molds from that environment move into your sinuses, into your lungs, into your gut. So you could be carrying the water damage building with you everywhere you go inside of yourself. That's, That's the thing. That's why people don't even think it could be a problem. They're like, yeah, in college, I lived in this yes. really moldy um, dorm room, but now I live in this really clean um, new build and there's no way that mold's a problem. Mm-hmm. And they, they don't believe at all that it could be something from 20 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I used to blame it on people bringing sick stuff with them. I used to think, oh, it's just because they moved, you know, their mattress. So they move their clothes. Mm -hmm. Usually it's clothes, especially a college store. You know, they may have been living somewhere that was furnished and it was really only their clothes and a few books that they brought with them. So I used to think, oh, it's just, you know, it's got to be in their clothes. And I've had a couple opportunities to test people's stuff um, where budget really wasn't an issue for a couple of families that I worked with and their stuff tested fine from their college exposure and sure enough there it was in their sinuses and gut yeah yeah so what it, what is your doctor's recommendation to me with me moving hopefully in the next few weeks with certain possessions um i've got like a really amazing boot collection and i don't want to get rid of it but i've heard oh. people are like no books have to go um and clothes could be remediated so what are your like definite no-nos and what are the things that could be salvaged the things that we see that I, um, with the families that I've worked with that have not been able to be remediated are upholstered furniture. Um, mattresses are also problematic because as you sweat at night, you're, mm-hmm. you're gathering and breathing out all these mycotoxins. So um, mattresses and upholstered furniture, basically because if you think about a, a couch, when you sit down on it, you know it compresses all the air out of it. And then when you stand up, it sucks in the air. So you get this hyper concentration of whatever was in the indoor air. Um, no problem with glass things, metal things. That's been no problem. We've had hit and miss success with wood furniture, uh, using, I have a a DIY all purpose essential oil cleaner on my website. If anybody's interested, we have used that with, I would say mixed success because it really depends on if it's real wood or if it's like, you know, compressed wood, was wood, as we call it, (laughs) used to be wood. Um, So you can use those different 
essential oils and those most of the things that are 100% wood, like true wood furniture, have essential oils in the waxes and resins of that wood. That's what helped it um, resist fungus all of its growth cycle. So um, those we've had pretty good success with, except for a few antiques that have been in exposure for a very long time and near the spores, um, not just like the mycotoxins floating around. Clothes, we don't really know. Uh, we know that there are some clothes that are a little more problematic than others, and it tends to be things that are more natural fibers because they're more easily digested. That's what mold's job is, is to digest decaying and, and dead living things. So um, boots, leather, that kind of thing can be pretty pl problematic. So my recommendation really, so that you don't have to overwhelm yourself, is take only the necessary things with you. Everything that leaves your house gets a triple wash as it's heading out. And I use essential oils. If you're sensitive to essential oils, that makes it a little more tricky. But a lot of people um, can use essential oils, even though they're high in aldehydes, and that's one of the things that mold pumps out. Um, but the nice thing about essential oils is they both neutralize mycotoxins and also kill the mold spores. So one thing we've learned from mold is that if you administer an antifungal, like amphotericin B, it will start to kick up its amount of mycotoxins that it makes in a defense. So that's why I really love mycotoxins because they can shut that down. There are other things that have been talked about, like borax and things like that. Um, I don't have any research on that, but I'm hoping somebody will do independent research. I mean, most of this that I'm telling you is just anecdotal from working with my patients. Um, we haven't tested borax to see if that works, but I think the idea there is that it will act as a detergent to get those fat soluble nutrient or fat soluble toxins off of the clothes. Um, let's see. So yeah. Oh, I was telling you what to do. What I recommend everybody do is just, if you can store everything, because if you're actively sick, you're not going to be able to tell if you're reacting to that thing or not. So put it in storage if you can, and then um, seal those things up. So I like to use plastic bins, seal them up with painter's tape, just so that you know it's a closed environment and you're not causing cross-contamination of something in your storage unit. And then when you get in your new space, take only the necessaries, get better, <laughs> and then start to work on pulling bins. And we have been out of our house quite a while and I still have two bins that I, I have stuff. It's like, you know, my diploma from school and, mm -hmm. you know, things that I would really like to keep. Um, but I, I still am reacting to those. So I don't even want to have a day where I don't yeah. feel good. So I'm just leaving them in storage until I get and even stronger or until I decide, you know, I probably could throw all that away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll live as a minimalist but, for a few months. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually, it's, it's so nice to have that happen. Yeah. It's very hard to bring things back into your environment. You know, once you have been made sick, if you look at a lot of us mold doctors, when you come to our houses, you know, it's a pretty minimalistic situation. Because, yeah. It's a good learning, you know, see, a good yeah. learning moment to That's right. not, I don't like stuff anyway, but there are a few things like old Absolutely. photographs and boots yeah. like I really love so I'll just I love boots and I have too. the yeah I'm, I'm currently at my parents house so I'll be moving in a few weeks so I can at least um just do it gradually but my question yeah. was with like washing things do I wash yes. it in the current washing machine that's um, in the home that I'm living in now or do I take everything and wash it in the new washing machine <laughs> I don't oh, want to like cross-contaminate it Right. So wash machines get very contaminated. So when you wash, it just sounds, I mean, the, it's the most sensitive way that you can do is to get a bucket in the, just outside of the, of the space. And this is depending on the weather where you live, that's either doable or not. Um, and literally hand wash them. Okay. And then you, you know, you can dry yeah. them in the new space. Yeah. Um, that's the most cautious, what most people do, because you're, if you're mold sick, you're just like overwhelmed mm -hmm. is dump tons of essential oils into, and when I mean tons, I mean a hundred drops per load into the current wash machine, mm -hmm. just get it washed and then get it to the next environment. But you do run the risk of, you know, recontaminating with that yeah. washer. So it really depends on what kind of washer it is. If it has a, a reserve, a water reserve of any kind, I often recommend that my patients, if they're like, I'm just not up for that hand washing stuff, it's just not going to happen. So then you pre-clean that washer with 100% bleach a couple of times before you run the load where you're cleaning all your things. 
and it's a front loading washer as well and they're notorious for having mold in like the yes. um, the seals whereas yes. in the US you have quite a lot of the um the top loading ones and they don't tend to accumulate as much yeah they're becoming very trendy these front loaders and so yeah i do have a video out there if anybody wants it's a video blog on um, front loading washers and how to maintain it you should be if you have anyone if you're listening you should be maintaining that every week you should be cleaning it and the things that are out there are sanitizers they're not killers so they just take care of the odor but that doesn't take care of the problem so you truly do need to use something that is antifungal not just a deodorizer once a week and keep yeah. the door open. Yeah. Store it always with the door open. Yeah. Good points. Yeah. Just yeah. friendly reminders. And when we're yes. when we're in the spring now, <laughs> we can all do a spring clean, but then keep on top yes. of it. Yes, that's right. And I yeah. do want to dive into a few of the mycotoxins in a bit more detail, like where we can be exposed to them. Are there any particular mm -hmm. symptoms that each of these can cause? The first one being ochratoxin A, and this mm -hmm. is sometimes associated with food. Um, what do you think and what are some of these moldy foods that we could potentially be reacting to? Yeah. So foods bring, there are kind of three classes of foods that could be problematic if you're sick from mold. The things that, so the first is the things that are actual fungal, fungus. So mushrooms, yeast, that means yeasted breads, anything that's leavened, um, that means alcohol, beer, wine, anything that is fermented. Um, the other class of foods are the things that are commonly contaminated with mycotoxins. So the foods themselves get moldy in storage or by how we, it's usually something where we're mass growing and we're mass storing. And I've noticed in our area, we had a whole um, pile of corn that was just getting rained on. And I'm sure it was going to animal feed, but you know, what they eat takes on mycotoxins also so that what we eat matters. So there are those kind of foods and those tend to be the things like any grain. Um, peanuts are notoriously high in fungus. I think that that's, I have a theory, but I think that that's really what's behind the anaphylactic reaction to peanuts. Mm, yeah. It's actually the mold that grows on it. Good point. Um, corn, uh, potatoes in our area, we have a terrible time with potatoes being moldy. Um, and then some fruits like grapes and cantaloupe that they will store and they get kind of moldy in storage. And coffee as more? well. Coffee's a big one. Coffee is huge. So something like a bulletproof coffee, that's a mold free coffee. Yeah. They're testing it. Um, and also soy. So sometimes people say, oh, I can't tolerate soy. And I think, I wonder how much of that too, is that we just didn't process it correctly. Um, and dried fruits. So um, the dates and figs and things like that. So then we also have a class of food that a lot of people who get sick from mold end up having a fungal overburden in the body and they become part of that fungal overburden can be candida overgrowth and some of the other fungi that are normally found symbiotically in our gut, but they start to overgrow. And so some foods that you want to avoid are foods that actually cause an increase in candidiasis or an increase in growth of those fungal families. Because right now with the mold exposure, all that flora balance that's normally found in the body homeostatically is thrown off and the fungus is winning. So that would be things like just sweets, fruit juices, baked goodies, you know, candy, cookies, that kind of thing. Um, and again, I take out the alcohol. Um, that's a sure way to, to host fungus in your body is to be drinking. Yeah. Yeah. If you'll like have an auto brewery inside, you're already probably yes. a little bit drunk the whole time anyway. So you don't need more. That's right. Yeah. That's kind of my joke, you know, breathe air, get drunk, you know, if you're in a water damage building, <laughs> yeah. you're just like, yeah. but it's not fun. Yeah. That's the thing. It's not, a... it isn't, <laughs> it's not a fun. No, 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 no. And that's why I think the visual test is so interesting that, you know, it's, um, and I give Dr. Shoemaker a lot of credit for recognizing that, that it is sort of like when you're drunk, your eyes don't converge appropriately. You get brain fog, you get fatigue, you know, that you can probably, all of us listening that are an adult can probably relate to the idea of one day you're like, okay, I have the whole evening to myself. I'm going to get this done and do this and this. I'm going to have a glass of wine. And then you get lazy and nothing like that happens. So you're asleep <laughs> you know, on the couch. The <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And the VCS yeah. test, um, I was one of the people who has mold quite significantly and passed the test. 
but I've yes. always been I think it's when you're um a little bit younger as well and I've always had really good eyesight um I would always pass the test and been told that I have like eyes like a hawk so I think that's maybe mm. why mm. I pass so don't use that test as a diagnostic I think they say if Correct. you fail it then that's a very good sign that you have issues with mold but if you pass that's not an automatic um thing right. to say that you're fine right and typically what I've seen is the people that pass it have enough good fats in their body or in their diet and they have um, good glutathione storage so they have the things to help the eyes with the convergence so my healthy diet's at least been paying off somehow yes. i always think like how much worse would i be if i ate junk food and didn't take care of myself because sometimes mm -hmm. you're like is this even worth buying this nice organic food if i still have all of these yes. symptoms but i always think no i'd be so much worse off if that was the case yeah, I get that question a lot. People say, okay, if I'm in the mold and I can't get out, either it's my job and I can't quite move jobs yet, or it's my house or I'm renting or, you know, do I even bother treating or is it just what, you know, nutrients wasted in the toilet? And I 100% I can guarantee you it's worth treating. We know this from animal studies um, and humans aren't that, we're animals too. So, you know, we don't have any human studies that there's kind of been a purposeful effort to not study this stuff in humans because then people have to start paying for things. <laughs> but we have a lot of animal studies and the animal studies show us that there are certain things that they're adding to feed. And many of the things are the things I put in my book. That's how we found out about turmeric and DHA. Um, that's how we found out about uh, selenium and CoQ10. They're adding it to animal feed in case they get exposed to mold. And there was a study where they, did, they did, took um, chickens and they gave um, one group of the chickens the the um, protective nutrients and one group of chickens, no protective nutrients, and they purposefully fed them mycotoxins, ochre toxin in this case. And the ones that took the protective nutrients were, they kept their body weight on their, you know, skeletal mat, um, body weight. Um, they, they didn't have as many deaths. Their kidneys were healthier, you know, all kinds of things. So we know that these are protective. So I, it is my um, strong recommendation that if you are in mold, that's all the more reason why you should be on treatment. And any other recommendations? So for people who are maybe in rented accommodation, they just can't move for another year or it's in the work or financially they just can't move. Is there anything that they can do like binders or any air filtration systems that could at least reduce exposure a little bit? Yeah. Um, so binders are tricky because they also bind necessary nutrients and fat soluble nutrients, which are exactly the nutrients that you need for fighting mold and protecting your cells. So the, our fat soluble nutrients are essential fatty acids, CoQ10, vitamins A, D, E, and K. If you are on a binder long-term, I've seen people actually come to me that have been on binders that are very deficient in those, and they're no longer mold sick, but they're malnutritioned. And so their symptoms are, are due to the malnutrition. There's also things that we use to make bile which is what the binders are grabbing. Bile picks up the toxins if we have a good functioning liver. And then we're supposed to poop those out. But we're made to conserve nutrients, which works really well when we're conserving nutrients. We reabsorb 93% of that bile or more. Um, that works great when you're in a starvation situation. But when you're in a toxin situation, then you're just recycling that toxin. So the idea of binders is it's grabbing that bile and pulling it out of the body. We can do this through food. Um, we've actually, kale has been shown to be an effective binder, steamed kale, not raw kale also, but that was um, less effective than steamed. So in my protocol, we add five to seven servings of vegetables every day to help nourish the, to help bind, but also we're nourishing the same things that people on a pharmaceutical binder end up deficient in. Vitamin A is found in um, kale. So, you know, again, we get that like use food as medicine. Yeah, um, I use binders when we, we know someone's crashing, we know they're going to have a new exposure. Like if they're going to, you know, go travel and you never know. Um, I'll use binders when I'm about to institute some antifungal therapy, because we know that there's going to be more spillage and things like that. But on a general rule, if you're following a five to seven servings of vegetables a day, and you add a little bit of insoluble fiber, which is what we know through studies to pick up bile, um, then they don't become depleted in those nutrients. And the bile nutrients we see depletion in is phosphatidylcholine, which is the lining of every single cell and every single mitochondria in our body. 
So if you're, that's one of the things too, I'm always a little cautious of binder excess because we can cause a fake mitochondrial dysfunction if we're taking away the, the phosphatidylcholine. And I got quite a huge die-off reaction when I started on phosphatidylcholine. I think it was just oh, pushing things out too quickly and same with glutathione. Yes. Um, I thought I'd try glutathione and I got a really bad headache and migraine and stomach aches. But now that mm -hmm. I've backed off a little bit, then started very slowly, that seems to have helped a lot. I think it was just yeah. mobilizing too many things too quickly. Yep. Definitely can happen. And, you know, people d shouldn't just like grin and bear it. That does, that's no, it's not like weightlifting. Like, oh, it's, it, look at, I, I'm getting so much better because I'm so sick. What that's doing is injuring your liver and your kidneys. Mm. So backing off is really important. Listen to your body with this. This isn't the same as weight training. More is not better. You know, going for the Herx is not the goal here because it's actually causing tissue damage. Yeah. Just a yeah. sign from your body and don't push past that. You're not yeah. going to get better results. More is right. better with that. Definitely. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a real stop sign. Ever. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, when I was yeah. speaking to Beth O'Hara again on mast cells and she was saying a lot of the time this Herx reaction, if it goes on for more than a few days, it's usually like a mast cell histamine response mm -hmm. and that's a chronic side of inflammation so you might get a little bit of bloating if you start a new probiotic but if you take a ton of new things at once and herbs and start to detox too quickly it could actually be a mast cell histamine response mm -hmm. so good and we see that. we see mold as the cause of mast cell activation yeah. syndrome a lot yes yeah. it's it's one of the major causes yeah. yeah talk about how that is it just because it clogs up the liver um how how are both of those things connected well, we don't really know yet exactly how they're connected. There are some methyl his, histone kind of things that are going on in the in the way that mold affects the immune system and the way that it affects the detoxification system. So that's really that cross point between detox and immune. Um, and then that's that's where we get the mast cell stimulation is when you get exposed to the mold the because part of the arm of your immune system is being suppressed the other part that is responsible for garbage cleanup has to get um, recruited and mast cells are really unique which she, i'm sure she's talked about all of this that they're they're sent out into tissue undifferentiated it means they're sent out to the tissue and they don't quite know what their job is other than inflame and and destroy so that the repair cells can come in and fix and then when they get to that tissue then they're going to differentiate into that tissue type. So that's how we can find mast cells all over the body. So you can have a respiratory exposure to mold mycotoxins and have a urinary mast cell reaction or a skin rat mast cell reaction. You know, it just depends on where those mast cells were sent and found the, the bulk of inflammation and tissue repair need, and then they'll destroy. That's their job is <laughs> to bring inflammation to, to clean up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they and do again, it by people... bombing. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. <laughs> and people yeah. think histamine, allergies, runny nose, itchy eyes. Mm -hmm. They don't think of the bladder irritation and the um, the palpitations, the anxiety. That's right. The all signs of excess histamine as well. Yeah, and mast cells can go through the blood-brain barrier. So that's one of the things that we see that I see most commonly as the combination of mold and mast cell activation is um, is definitely hitting the thalamus in the brain, which is our safety center. So people feel unsafe in the world. You can get anxiousness. You can even get to the point to where you're having ticks, tremors, and that kind of thing. So yeah, just all from a mast cell, something we think of as an allergy. Yeah. And then yeah. last summer, I went on holiday. And on the final night, we went to a nice Chinese, uh, a nice Thai restaurant. And I had tamari duck. And as soon as I ate mm. the um, the sauce, my brain lit up. I was obsessed yes. with it. My like um, dopamine and <laughs> like happy pleasure centers of the brain lit up and I was like obsessed with it. But then the very next morning on the drive home, like an eight, uh, eight hour drive down the motorway, uh, I wasn't driving thankfully, but I had a seizure and I was <gasps> like, vomiting in a cyclical pattern, like, trying Ooh. to open the door on the motorway, like when, <laughs> when they were driving. So I think the, at the time I was like, oh, it must just be like food poisoning or something, but that wasn't my typical food poisoning reaction. And then I realized it was from MSG in the mm. sauce. Mm. So very, my brain must've been so inflamed and then that just tipped yep. it over the edge. Soaked it up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
scary yeah, stuff. And I'm, so I won't um, be having I, that again. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a, that's this, the thalamus is where all that dopamine is, that basal ganglia, that area. And um, yeah, that can become a real cycle too, because when people have had constant histamine reaction, there's something called limbic dysregulation. So you have that, but they can also become sort of addicted to the inflammation because then the body has to bring endorphins to that area and kephalins and things that calm pain. So people will actually gravitate toward these things. The no-no foods I was just talking about, they'll gravitate toward those foods or they'll gravitate toward um, hobbies like being a brewmaster that are actually creating more of a problem and more histamine response because now there's a little bit of a buzz that they get when they're when they're in that environment and without it there's a kind of a, a depletion a, um, that they almost feel depressed because they don't have any more energy so that can become this whole cycle it's like with dairy products isn't it people who are like mm -hmm. do not take my cheese away from me because they're so right, obsessed right. with it they're like no i've eaten it like every day for my whole entire life there's no way that i'm sensitive and they're having this casomorphine response from the dairy. So exactly if you, if you are same. really drawn yeah. to a type of food, it could be that you're actually sensitive to it. Uh-huh. Yeah. People then, don't like to hear that. I'm I always know. the bearer of bad news. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, another mold that I wanted to talk, or mycotoxin that I wanted to talk about, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Zerolone? Zerolone, yeah. yeah. And actually, we should go back to ochratoxin real quick, just on okay. the building side. Yeah. Um, if you do have a contractor that you're consulting with, um, one of my patients that, that had the black mold in his house, his contractor had told him that because the line of mold wasn't growing, it was fine. And so contractors have these ideas about mold that are just not correct for health. And what we're hearing a lot in our area, and especially with the um, building inspectors that aren't looking at things holistically and not looking at health outcomes, they're saying that aspergillus, aspergillus and penicillium, which create okra toxin, are fine because they're not stachybotrys. They're not the toxic black mold. And that is incorrect, 100% incorrect. Just because it's found more often now doesn't mean it's normal and healthy. So I just want to like put that out there about okra yeah. toxin. We know <laughs> okra toxin causes kidney cancer. So don't mess around. Yeah. Okay. You so gave me the name of, um, is it Brian Carr, did you say? The person who yes. you recommend in the US? Yes. Okay. Yep. He has a, an online course called Mold Masterclass that I just love. When I first started in mold, I would have loved to have had this resource for my patients. Um, and the, the information about it is on my website if you want to just kind of read what I, what I think about it. But um, yeah, he, is, he looks at things holistically and he takes he takes it seriously. You know, he has worked with enough sensitive patients. You know, some of these guys just don't want to deal with the sensitive patients. So his kind of work is more holistic. And also um, in my area, the person who's taught me everything that I know is Martine Davis. Mm -hmm. She's kind of a national U.S. Um, expert hero <laughs> yeah, and also spends some time in France. So, um, and she does consults um, distance consults and things like that. So you Great. can pick her brain and yeah, I'll link just, to both of those in the episode yeah. show notes for everyone. Great. Yeah. She's at airinspector.com. She's fantastic. Great. And is someone that is, she won't be convinced, you know, when you're sick from mold, you try to start convincing other people that it's not a problem <laughs> out of all the environmental medicine patients that I work with from lead toxicity to mercury poisoning from, from dental work to, um, atrazine in our water, we're in a high atrazine area, all kinds of different things that I'm dealing with with pa different patients. And mold patients are the ones that are the most resistant to this being the problem. They, it takes a lot of convincing. And the nice thing about Martine is that she doesn't let you talk her out of it. <laughs> you know, Good. She's like, straight yeah. talking. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you need sometimes because of you're not you thinking do. straight, you've got the brain fog yeah. and anxiety. You need someone to tell it to you straight. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So with She's an the... OBS kind of gal. Yeah. Good. So Xarelinone, yeah. this is where it's going to be really interesting for you and your topic with the hormones. Xarelinone is an estrogenic mycotoxin um, and it does some really creepy things for men as well. So if men are listening and they're like, oh, I don't have, I can tune out to this. <laughs> um, in men, it actually creates spermatocyte degeneration and testes. It can actually cause degradation of the testes. 
So not only is it estrogenic, meaning it can, if you have that happening as a man, it can cause moobs, you know, man boobs and things that are more estrogenic and weight gain and um, that kind of thing. But also we know this one goes directly to the testes and affects fertility and, um, test, and the testes themselves. So, um, but for women, the estrogen is, um, we talk a lot about the good estrogen and the bad estrogen. The, the estrogen that xarelinone is mimicking is the bad estrogen. So it's blocking, it's acting like a xenoestrogen. It's blocking those receptors and activating them just a little bit, but not in a balanced way. And it's blocking your own endogenous estrogen. And we have seen a link with this particular one to estrogen-related cancers. Yeah, this one potentially is found... like endometriosis or fibroids as well. I don't know if there's any research on that. You know, I don't know the, if there is research on fibroids would make sense. Yeah. Endometriosis and fibroids would make sense that it would trigger that same xenoestrogen, you know, mm -hmm. same, same receptors. Yeah. But I don't know that we have research. That's sort okay. of a, you know, we're, we're trying to put all those pieces together, um, particularly with endometriosis also because it's an autoimmune condition mm -hmm. that you have the immune depletion. We know that the sequela of having an immune depletion is more infections, and the second is autoimmune disease, increase in autoimmune. So it does make sense to me that you would have that kind of endometriosis aggravation. And yeah. clinically, like with hormone testing, like what are the key things that you see? So estrogen dominance, um, what about the thyroid, like autoimmunity, I'm guessing, with that, or adrenal health, yeah, anything? So that what I'm working on right now is trying to understand does it actually create an estrogen on the lab? Is it messing up our lab tests? And that I don't know yet. So I, I am not sure if we're able to see, and that's my big question mark, is that is it better to, to run a 24-hour urine test? I mean, that, that's typically what I'm doing for, urine, for a hormone assessment just because I'm trying to put together a whole bunch of different pieces of people who have, you know, really profound chronic illness. Um, and what I want to work with some companies on, if anybody's listening wants to do this with me, is are, if you have xarelinone in your body, is it actually overexpressing on your other labs? Is it mimicking estrogen enough that it's, it's being shown as having a high estrogen situation? I don't think that that's the case, um, but we don't know yet. And so I think what you might be seeing on labs is an estrogen suppression of your own. So if you're doing blood labs, you might see in a low estradiol. Um, you might see a high FSH. But the tricky thing with this is it's going to mimic like a pituitary deficiency because I think that the feedback loops, and that's another thing we don't know, are the feedback loops telling the body don't make any more estrogen because it's feedback looping to the, to the brain to say we don't need any more. Look at all these things. So you can actually, you know, it's acting in two different ways, not just, you know, being estrogenic, but also the feedback loop of suppressing your own endogenous estrogen. Yeah, I think there's a link we don't know that yet. Low testosterone in men and women as well. So I have PCOS yes. too, and you'd expect me to have very high testosterone levels, but over the past few years, it's always been like postmenopausal range testosterone. Interesting. Yeah. So I haven't really gone down that road a whole lot with people, you know, as far as testing goes, I do see that when we know it's mold and we treat it, these kind of things get better because we're, cleaning out the fat stores in the body. So the cholesterol coming into the pump is cleaner. And then we're cleaning out the liver so the body can process those hormones better. But you know, the, the solution to pollution is dilution is one of my, you know, rhymes that was pounded into my mind from my teachers in environmental medicine. And it's so critical that we're diluting with good fats because this is a fat soluble toxin. So if anybody is listening and you're fat phobic, you got to get over it <laughs> because <laughs> you need those good fats or you're not going to be able to move these fat soluble toxins out of there. And what are your favorite sources of healthy fat? Oh boy, everything like olives, olive oil, avocados, avocado oil, walnuts, walnut oil, fish. Um, I'm a fan of eggs if they're, if they're grown right, raised right, you know, farm eggs, farm fresh eggs, cage free that they're eating all the little insects that are gathering up those omega-3s. Yeah, not any um, moldy corn. We don't want them eating. No moldy corn. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We want them to eat moving, non-moldy insects. Yeah. They don't, don't have any moss on their back, so to yeah. speak. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. when do you jump into looking into mold? I'm guessing like your, your clients or patients 
are coming to you with mold tests, they know that it's a problem for them or they're chronically sick and they've been down all other avenues. But with an average person, like where would you recommend when when would you recommend looking into mold? Like right off the bat and rule it out as a possibility, or would you start with the basics? So the naturopathic things we know about healing their guts and um increasing nutrient intake because sometimes sinusitis and bloating and ibs can clean up and clear up just with those things Mm -hmm. or do you wait and see if they improve and then turn to the mold testing that's a great question so i um in my book i put an orange in there to describe how i approach treatment because it's the best thing to describe how i approach treatment for lots of things and the idea is that if you're already doing the fundamentals, I, I, so in answer to your question, I do all the fundamentals. I don't jump to mold, even though I probably have mold goggles on now that that's what I do a lot. And yeah, my, now my patient base is all people who know it was mold. But when I started in practice, I would start with all the fundamentals, you know, get your circadian rhythm on track, no watching screens until midnight and then trying to get sleep. That's not going to happen. Moving your body, diet, Um, healing relationships, you know, all of this stuff, getting outside every day. Those are the basic things. And the diet can be very targeted to people, but basically no one is going to be harmed from eating five to seven servings of vegetables a day. Some of my patients with low enzyme status and not a lot of fire in their belly need that to be more cooked versus raw. So raw can undo them. So, you know, when I have said that one time when I was speaking, somebody said, I, I actually don't feel good eating that many vegetables. And I'm like, well, then you're probably eating too much raw for what you can digest. So five to seven servings of vegetables a day, getting good protein. Um, if someone's vegetarian, making sure that protein is really like mostly seeds um, and then add the nuts. And so that's one of the things that I see a lot of people not do is get enough protein, good fats. You know, we do all of those things. So many conditions get better because they're lifestyle conditions. Then we're stuck with the people that don't. Okay. Is this a disease process that's gone on too long? Is there toxicity? Is there targeted treatment that we need? Or is it genetic? You know, not everybody comes into this world healthy. You know, we have more and more autistic kids being born, more and more cases of pandas and pans and people as adults doing this. So and they could have an infection, stealth infections. So we treat that. And if they don't get better, then I look for mold. Now, now I'm at the place where if we've done all the reasonable things for maybe someone has diabetes, blood sugar dysregulation and hypertension or high blood pressure, and we're doing all the reasonable things and we're not seeing a response, now I give them the Lyme questionnaire and the mold questionnaire. I said, just fill this out and let me see if we need to rule this out because most people don't remember their tick bite. And in mold, a lot of times it's a hidden problem. So we wouldn't necessarily know that that's the cause. And there are lots of environmental things that, that could be too. Like we talked about, you know, mercury toxicity from their fillings or, you know, there could be lots of other things. So I always start with the first reasonable things. People who are sick can only do a few things at a time anyway. So while they're working on that homework and I'm waiting for lab work to come back, then we talk about what to do as the next plan and try not to do too many things at once. Cause as you experienced, you know, the body can, it doesn't like change either. You know, our brains don't like change and our bodies can only handle what they can handle. So you do little bits at a time. I can imagine people listening. That's why I wanted to make that point people listening like oh I have sinusitis and I have IBS so let me get a mold test right away and I need to move house and oh my god my life is going to fall apart please don't do that if but if you have been on your health journey for many years and you've quote doing all the right things and you're still symptomatic then yes this may be a thing to look into Mm -hmm. and I love your naturopathic naturopathic (laughs) approach because now there is a lot of things like ozone therapy, IV nutrients, where you're just like, start with the diet, fix the Mm -hmm. foundational things. But what are your thoughts on some of these other therapies that are sometimes used with mold or some of these other chronic illnesses? They're really great for jumping the the line, so to speak, but um, they do not work unless you have the fundamentals in place. That's when we get more side effects. And you also don't get the big reactions and improvements that people report. You know, I I tried that early on with Lyme. I was like, oh, all right, we're going to put everyone on antibiotics and um, put everyone on IV therapy for vitamin C. We're going to build their vitamin C so they can kill all these bugs. And you just didn't see the response unless they were doing all of their own homework as well. 
Yeah. Something but that I really... think that they can be super helpful. You know, ozone is incredible. Yeah. And something that really helped me was coffee enemas. Mm-hmm. And um, that, I know that's people are like, oh my God, what do you mean? <laughs> I've spoken about them many times, but they're, they're really effective. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to put them in my book, but I just didn't feel like it was a good general, okay thing yeah. for everybody to do. Exactly. Um, but there are lots of things that you can do that don't involve eating something. You know, like there's, there are mud baths, peat therapy is more mm. common in, in Europe than yeah. in the United States. So peloid therapy, where you get in a muddy bath using living mud and it's incredibly detoxifying. There's saunas, there's lymphatic massage. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do to help detoxify. It doesn't all involve a supplement. <laughs> yeah. People are like, I'm on 50 supplements. I don't want to take anything else. Yeah. Uh-huh. So turn yeah. to food, turn to Epsom salt baths either, even just to get a little bit of sweat on, dry body mm-hmm. brushing. Some of these things yes. are commonly overlooked and they're all very cheap and inexpensive and accessible to a lot of people. Yeah. And a lot of people don't, if you're really toxic, they don't necessarily feel good mm. when they do them. And that's a sign, you know, that's a real, that's information for your practitioner to know because then we know what level of depletion we're dealing with or what level of toxicity. Yeah. I also wanted to ask about Marcon's. And if you have any, so if you could first explain what it is for those who aren't aware and are there any effective non-pharmaceutical options? Because when I look at it, it's, you need this specific nasal spray that's probably going to cost you hundreds of pounds. It's going to be very hard for you to get and there's no other options, but um, I see you do a lot with essential oils. So what would your approach be to treating that? Yeah. So I'm kind of reining back on the, the treatment approach is get the body ready and then do antifungal therapy to reset the balance of the fungal burden. So the steps or whatever that I lay out is first you do avoidance because that's the most important part is getting away from the mold. Um, Then the fundamentals, then you protect any tissues and repair any tissues that those mycotoxins have damaged so that you can get ready for the fight, which is resetting the balance in the body of the antifungals. That approach is very unique from what is out there. That's different than a shoemaker protocol or other protocols. It's what I developed because I noticed that if I was only addressing the mycotoxins, mopping them up, if the factory is still running and creating the smoke, all I'm going to be doing is cleaning up smoke forever. And I have antifungals that are in botanical form. And we know about things like ozone. We know about you know essential oils that we don't have to wait for somebody to be frankly infected. I'm not waiting around for an invasive aspergillosis to warrant using this big medication. I have plants and plants have multiple mechanisms of action and they're gentler on the body because they're whole. Nature gives us the antifungal piece, but it also gives us some anti-inflammatory, some bile moving, some, you know, it has lots of things in there in that whole plant that help the person manage an antifungal. But I don't generally start with antifungal because I had a Lyme and mold patient that when I went right to the antimicrobials, the antifungals, she had a seizure. Mm. So it's very similar to your experience. So yeah, I learned that you kind of have to prep the body. So by adding the antifungals, antifungals, in my opinion, need to be both systemically, so the whole body, and they need to be also addressing the nasal biome because that's, for most of us, that's our exposure to this. That's our first interface with this toxin. So the nasal biome is commonly messed up and that's where we get Marcon's. Marcon's is multiple antibiotic resistant staph. And we also see MRSA common in water damage building exposed people. Um, For a while, that was the target uh, for, I think in Shoemaker protocol, they were targeting Marcon's. Um, and for me, it just generally makes sense that you would address that, but also to address the whole systemic body. Now, of course, a medical doctor, if your only tool is a triazole family drug, that doesn't make sense to use that if the person is only colonized or whatever, because those drugs have their own side effects. Although there are some that are doing it very functionally by just dripping them in a couple days a week. So pulsing for two days a week and then pulsing two more days a week. You know, there can be different ways to use even pharmaceuticals holistically. But um, when we have plants, we can treat the whole body holistically and get the biome of the gut, which is continuous with the sinuses, get that reset. And it makes it so much easier to deal with the stuff in the sinuses. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's... um, I'll use essential oils. There's, I have a video on YouTube yep. if anyone wants called the DIY essential oil nasal spray. 
You can make your own nasal spray. There are things like um, people snort um, probiotics. Uh, there's xylitol, which is a biofilm buster and also antibacterial. There's silver, there's biocidin, there's all kinds of things that you can use in a neti pot or as a spray and to try to reset that sinus biome. So you would always recommend treating regardless of if someone has sinus based issues. So even if they had like digestive issues, you'd always recommend yes. it just in case. Yes, I do because that's our first interface. And that was the, I learned that experientially with my patients that I was not addressing that. And it wasn't until addressing the sinuses, even though there was no sinus symptoms, no overt, but it's interesting because once you start treating them, people are like, well, I didn't realize I wasn't really breathing very well. You know, they'll notice a shift in, in their ability to breathe. Um, but it wasn't until adding that, that we saw a deep resolution of the neurological stuff, pelvic pain, ear ringing, um, vulvodynia, um, irritable bowel, where it's like a migraine, you know, if you've heard these abdominal mm. migraines, oc um, occipital migraines. So dementia, you know, all these things that are like deep neurological didn't get better until we addressed the sinus. And the testing doesn't look very pleasant either. So I'd probably rather just yeah. go ahead <laughs> with, the, with the netty pot. Exactly. Treatment. Yeah. <laughs> and I did test a lot and I found it a lot and I thought, well, why... Yeah. Why am I testing them? Why am I putting people through the discomfort and the cost of the testing? So basically my rule of thumb is if you've been exposed to water damage building, you have sinus biome disruption, period. Spend yeah. your money on probiotics to snort and organic kale. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, it was not grown in thallium rich soil. That's exactly. one of the problems we're having. Point. Oh, we can't win. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so last few questions before we finish up now. Um, more on you. So how you stay hormonally healthy, doing the amount of work that you do. Um, so the first one is what's one herb, nutrient or supplement that you just couldn't live without? Ooh. That is such, it's so not a food, an herb or supplement. Mm -hmm. I think probably for me personally, it would be holy basil. Oh, cool. Yeah. So antihistamine, yeah. adaptogen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites. Oh yeah. yeah. And it clears the mind. So for me personally, when I got sick from mold, my, my thinking ability was really compromised. And when, you know, using your brain is your job, um, that was very hard. For me to have that happen so yeah i just i love my holy basil tea every morning that's like my coffee me too. yeah you know? yeah <laughs> me too love that one mm -hmm. and what's something that you do every day to stay in hormonal harmony i get outside every day i spend an hour at least outside and i know that if you live in a city that's a little trickier to do especially with coronavirus so borrow mm -hmm. someone's dog <laughs> um the dog will be happy for multiple walks <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, getting outside and, and being in touch with nature. So if you're stuck inside right now with coronavirus, bring a plant in or something where you can be in touch with nature. Um, that's what keeps me spiritually healthy. That's what keeps me physically healthy. That's what keeps my natural killer cell count up um, and restored it through all of my personal mold exposure. Um, but we really, really have done nature a disservice and it's our duty to get back in touch with her. Agreed. And then last question is, where can people find more about you online? So where can they pick up your book, access your courses? Because we do have some practitioners listening as well. So tell us where we can find you. Sure. Uh, my website is drkrista.com. That's D-R-C-R-I-S-T-A.com. I have a video blog page there where I post random little bits of inspiration. There's a couple of years worth of uh, videos out there. Um, if I'm out on a walk or I'm talking with a client and I, um, I hear the same question over and over again, or get an email over and over again, I'll put a video blog together and put it out there. So there's a ton of information there. All the podcasts that I've been on are on there. So you can really get a deep dive. And then there's a mold quiz on moldquiz.com. If you're listening and you're thinking, Ooh, I didn't know ear ringing was a thing. Maybe I'm going to go <laughs> take a look at that. Um, then you can take the quiz at moldquiz.com. And my practitioner course is on my website courses page. Amazing. And the video clips are really great. They're very short and sweet. And that's great if you do have brain fog. <laughs> yes, that was the intention not to go too far. Like yeah. it was kind of nice that Instagram said you have to do it under a minute, you know, because it did force me to narrow down on one, one topic and keep it short and sweet. Yeah, get to yeah. the point. That's what we need. And then 
the book just for your us listeners right now amazon is not delivering non-essential ah, things okay so you can order it direct from me the book direct from me and ebook though is still um yeah. being delivered and that's on amazon yeah and i must admit i have not picked up the book just yet I'm actually waiting until I move so I can get the physical copy because yeah. I know it's going to be something <laughs> yeah. that I'm referring back to all the time. Oh, so awesome. I've, I've probably read everything else that you've ever put out on Instagram mm-hmm. and your blog. So um, yeah, I really appreciate your stuff. And I'll be, the first thing I do when I move, um, I'll wash my clothes and then I'll uh-huh. hop online and order your book. So thank nice. you so much, Jill, for your yeah. time. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. I really appreciate the chance to spread the word. Thank you.